As we enter this place of worship week by week, I wonder how often maybe we stop and think that we are coming into the presence of Almighty God and we have the privilege of honoring Him and worshiping Him and singing praises unto His name. The God who has made Himself known to us as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the God of this universe. We're going to stand and praise His name today as we begin this service. Number 248, God our Father, we adore Thee. But it isn't just the Father, we sing also to the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's stand together and sing. Please remain standing after the prayer. Father, we do worship you today and we adore you and praise you for who you are and for all that you've done for us. Father, we thank you most of all for Jesus, for the cross, for salvation that we have through him. We thank you for your precious Holy Spirit who drew us, who convicted us of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. We thank you, Father, for the word of God through which we gain faith. Oh, Lord, we thank you for all that you have done to bring us to yourself. And now we stand here this morning in this place that we call a sanctuary. And we are here worshiping you today because of our relationship with you. Father, if there's one here today that does not know Jesus, that's not able to worship you in truth and in spirit, oh, Father, how I pray that something will be said today either through the songs or through what will be spoken during the service and the message and all the information that we will be receiving today from those who have come to speak and share with us about the sanctity of human life. Oh, Father, how I pray 
that you will speak to us today. Please, Father, save the lost, encourage and bless the saved. And we'll be careful to praise you and thank you for all that you do because of your great love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It seems like it has been a month since we've been to church. Uh, but uh, it's a joy to see you. Good crowd this morning. And if you're visiting with us today, it's a joy to have you. We always welcome uh, visitors into this congregation on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We, we are so pleased that you chose to come here and worship at Pleasant Hill today. And if you are a first-time visitor with us this morning, I would encourage you to look in the back of the pew in front of you, and you should find a visitor's card. If you would, please take just a moment to fill one out, place it in the offering plate when it comes around this morning. We would greatly appreciate you doing that. Now that I've taken just a moment to welcome all of you, I want to ask every one of you to take a moment to turn around and welcome someone to the service this morning. Would you do that, please?
tomorrow because he lives and we can face tomorrow because we, we know that he's got the whole world in his hands. Let's sing that. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the beautiful Lord's day, Lord, to worship you. God, we just, uh, I just thank you for the Sunday school teachers, the ones that brought the lessons this morning. Thank you for them, Lord, what they mean to us. I pray, Lord, that you would be in this service in this 11 o'clock hour, Lord. Open our hearts that we may receive the word, Lord. And just, uh, I just pray that everyone will be touched, Lord. God, I just pray for this offering, Lord that we'd use it in accordance to your will, Lord. Bless the gift and the giver, Lord. God, forgive us this day of our sins, Lord. Be with those that are sick and suffering. Uh, you know each one, Lord. The list is long. Be with those where death may have come recently, Lord. Bless those families. Give them strength and comfort and understanding, Lord. Now just uh, be with us today, Lord, throughout the remainder of the day. Lead God and direct us. Keep us safe. I ask all these things in the blessed holy name of Jesus Christ, my Savior. Amen.
Well, you've noticed this morning that we've, uh, we've sung some old hymns like Jesus Loves Me, the little song they played just then. Uh, this has all been in preparation for the theme for today's service, and today we are observing Sanctity of Human Life. And uh, we're so privileged to have with us today um, Sharon Kelly, who is the Executive Director of uh, Lifeline Pregnancy Help Center of Elkin. And she has with her a guest, and she will be introducing her at the appropriate time in the service this morning. But I, I want you to give these ladies your utmost attention today, because I believe they have something special to share with us. Uh, I invited Sharon to come ask her to bring someone with her that could give a testimony. And uh, so they are going to come after the choir does their special, and you give them your attention this morning and be in prayer for them. Uh, as they come to share with us. You may not be aware of this, but since Roe versus Wade, and I think this was, what, in 1973, I think it was, over 53 million babies have been murdered in the United States of America. That is a major issue, folks. I hope you will listen, and we will learn. And I hope that God brings us under deep conviction today about this issue in our nation. So Sharon, I'm going to ask you to come after the choir finishes their special this morning. Great to have you and your husband with us today and our other guest, and I will let you introduce her. Okay? God bless you. Thank you, Gary.
Well, good morning. It's a real joy to be with you this morning. I was so um, tickled when Pastor Dodds called and asked if we could arrange to be here this morning. Let me get this a little bit closer. Uh, to be here with you this morning to um, have your sanctity of life service. And, you know, sometimes we just think of it as another service we have at the beginning of the year, and we'll get that over with and move on. <laughs> Every day is sanctity of life. The origin of sanctity of life came about in 1984, January 13th. I don't know if you knew that or not, but President Reagan was our president at the time, and he issued a proclamation uh, designating January 22nd as a National Sanctity of Human Life Day. I don't know how many of you re realize that or not, but that's just been 84. That's not that long ago, really. But he saw the importance of designating a day for that. And the reason it was set for January 22nd is because in 1973, of, um, of January 22nd, 1973, was when our Supreme Court legalized abortion through the case of Roe v. Wade. So our president saw at that time that we needed to set aside a day to commemorate the lives lost to abortion. This is the reason we churches in our United States, America, across the United States, who believe God's word, we celebrate God's gift of life, basically, on Sanctity of Life Day. And we also commemorate the many lives that have been lost to abortion. And um, like your pastor said, over 53 million have been lost to abortion since 1973. And then another reason is to commit to protecting human life at every stage. That's why we have a Sanctity of Life service. We just set aside one Sunday out of the year usually to commemorate those things and to celebrate life. So that's why we're having a Sanctity of Life Sunday today. And um, we got it postponed a little bit, but that's okay. Like I said, we can have Sanctity of Life every day. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, and I know, um, I have heard your pastor preach sermons from this pulpit, and I know he has preached on the sanctity of life, what God's word has to say about the sanctity of life, and how he regards life as very, very important. <clears throat> in fact, uh, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, it says this, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. So even before he was born, God says he knew Jeremiah. He knew him even before birth. Doesn't that tell us something? I think that God knew each one of us. And then again, in uh, Psalm 139, and these are very familiar scripture verses for us because I know, like I said, your pastor has preached probably from these very, sermon, these very uh, scriptures, but 139, 13 through 16, God's word says, For you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. So it's saying, even before our birth, our days were ordained. So life is precious. Life is a gift from God. You know, God is the author of life. He's the one that created life to begin with. Back in Genesis chapter 1, we read about how that he formed 
Adam and Eve, how that he created life. And he didn't just haphazardly do that, as God never haphazardly does anything. But he made us in his image. And that's what separates us from the rest of his creation, is because he's created each one of us in the image of God. Is that not precious? That we are made in his image? That he thought that much of us? So we have to really consider, first of all, do we be, believe God's word to be absolute truth? Because if we do, then we have to understand that our life is sacred and that he created us and each one of us have a purpose in his plan. And then we have to consider, if God's word is true, that when does this life begin? Does it begin after you're born? Or does it begin at conception, when you were first formed? Because if we believe the Bible to be true, and we read these verses about he knew us before we were even formed in the secret places of our mother's womb, then we have to believe that life began at conception. And there's so many things that are going on. I wish I could just describe all the wonderful things that happen at that moment of conception when those little tiny cells began to multiply and divide. And, and then by the time a mother, a woman realizes that she could be pregnant, um, almost every single time that baby has already formed so much and there's so much going on, almost all the organs are present that are actually working during that time. And so it's very precious to think of how a miracle life is and that God has ordained that. Do we believe God is the author and the authority of our lives? Do we really believe that? We might say it. Let's, let's just Think about inwardly, do we believe God is the authority of our lives? If we believe that God has authority, full authority, full control of our lives, who are we to take a life? Who are we to condone that? And it doesn't matter the circumstances. We are made in the image of God. He created us. Our life begins at that conception time. So who are we to be saying we'll take a life at any point before birth? If we as Christians do accept this authority of God in our lives, that he is in full control of everything in our lives, we know that he is ultimately in control and not us. It's not us. It's all about him. But you know what? We might believe that. We might really truly believe that. But it is not our job or our position to point a finger to those who disagree with us. And you might find that a little hard to do because you want to. <laughs> you want to set them straight. But at the same time, they don't understand. Maybe they just don't understand that God is in full control, that he does have authority over us. Our position is, should be to love them and to love them and to show them what God's word has to say. They may ridicule us for believing what we do because we stand on God's word, but as we know, those times are getting closer and closer to us. If you, if you live long enough and you stand up for what you believe in, you will be ridiculed for what you believe. But it's how we react to that that's so important. It's how we react to those that do ridicule us for what we believe. And if we do it in a loving way, we'll have much more opportunity to reach these people than we do if we just point a finger and condemn. So our job is really to love people, right? We need to think biblically. You know, we can get in a habit of going through life and just, um, you know, go through the motions, so to speak. But we really need to think biblically about what God's word has to say. We need to 
like I said, love those who are in this world who do not know them as their Savior and lead them maybe to an understanding of what that means to come to Christ, as their, uh, to know him as their Savior. Our role at Lifeline is, is part of the Great Commission. One of the mission, one, in, our, in our mission statement, it's that we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, we're there to help those women who are facing an unplanned pregnancy. We're here to help them to see life for their children. Yes, we're here to help them through maybe a past abortion uh, that they've had, to help them get through some of those emotional scars and those pains that they have. But our ultimate goal is to point them to church, Jesus Christ. Because ultimately, that is what is going to change their life. If they can have a change of heart, if they can know him as their savior, sure, it's not going to take away all their problems, but that is what the basis is for the rest of their decision making and for the rest of their life and how they can live their lives to give him glory. We believe that every person that comes through our door, and I don't care if it's just a salesperson or if it's the postman or if it's a girl in a crisis pregnancy. We believe those are divine appointments, that we can share the love of Christ with them in not only just word, but in deed. We believe that each individual, each one of us are unique. And we can go through and describe all of that uniqueness but we really, really are. Each one of us has a different personality. Our DNA is totally different. Everything about us is different. And that's not, everybody that comes through our door is different. Everybody that comes through our door has a different set of circumstances, has a different set of problems, have a different outlook on life. And so we're there for each one of those individuals. And because each individual is so different, and God has made us that way, um, we need to there, there to love them unconditionally. Yes, there are some that might dress differently. They may have different outward appearances to us. We, but we love them all the same because their soul, we need to look at them as people that Jesus loves enough that he died for us. But we've got to look beyond that immediate need. And I don't know what your, what your perception is of what Lifeline Pregnancy Help Center does. But I hope after today you'll have maybe a little different perspective. And I'd love to say, yeah, we're there just all about saving babies. And we are about that. But there's a whole lot more to it than just that. We're there and as an extension of you all, actually, but we're there to reach out to these um, men and women who come through our doors in need. And today I brought um, a good friend, she's become a good friend of mine, and she was, um, I've just loved watching her grow um, as time has gone by, but she came to Lifeline at a time in her life that um, she was in a desperate need and I'll never forget, I don't know how much she's going to go into this, but um, Katie came to us with her parents, but her dad called Lifeline one, one afternoon. And um, I don't think you'll mind me saying anything about your dad, but he was a deacon in one of the local churches. And uh, he called me, and I had no idea why he was calling, but then it our conversation started to turn and he said, well, I have a request. And he told me about Katie's situation and he said, is there any way you could meet with us this evening or one evening after hours? I said, I would love to. So we set up a time for them to come. And although Katie had a lot of family support through her situation, it was a time when the voices of the world around her uh, could have caused her to make a different decision that would have made her life so different than it is today. But I'm going to let her tell her story, and she's going to come up. This is Katie Swain, and um, 
I'll just say this. She sent me a picture of her baby. I'm not, I'm going to steal a little thunder, but um, sent me a picture, and I keep it in my Bible because uh, we don't get this all the time. We don't get uh, clients that will always just stay in such close um, touch with us, but she sent me a picture of her baby after he was born, and um, I keep that in my Bible as a reminder of, of that time. But Katie's going to share her story. I'm just, I just saw that there's Kleenexes. I'm so glad. <laughs> uh, I had never considered my life to be a story until I was asked to share my testimony at a fundraiser banquet for Lifeline Pregnancy Center. Lifeline is a local pregnancy help center that offers free and confidential help for women during and after pregnancy and for both men and women who are battling through post-abortion syndrome. When I was first asked to speak on behalf of Lifeline Pregnancy Center, I was a little hesitant. After all, I was just a single girl with a child. Who would want to hear about that? It's amazing to me that you can go your whole life not really noticing something and then one day open your eyes and that thing is all around you. For me, that unnoticed thing was single parents and unplanned pregnancy. Unplanned. That only means that it wasn't in our plans. Over the years, I have discovered that God's plans are often completely different than our own plans for ourselves. But in turn, the end result that he has planned for us is always so much grander than what we could have ever pictured for ourselves. Isaiah 25.1 says, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness you have done marvelous things, things planned long ago. I was raised in a Christian home, brought up by my parents to love the Lord and pursue his will in all things. I attended church alongside my, th my two sisters every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, vacation Bible school. But as I grew older, I also grew more rebellious. About midway through my senior year of high school, I woke up one morning and was completely blind in my left eye. After a series of blood tests, x-rays, and CAT scans, the doctors concluded that the cause of my blindness was unknown and were unsure if I would lose my sight further. The doctors prescri prescribed me prednisone to lessen the swelling in my optic nerve, but the damage was irreversible. My optic nerve had been ho hollowed out, and my vision was left permanently altered. At that time, my mom told me that this was God trying to get my attention, but I was stubborn, and I still wouldn't give it to him. In October of 2004, during a routine exam, I found out I was pregnant. I can re vividly remember the night that I told my mom, I told her she would have to be the one to tell my dad because I didn't have the nerve. What a shame that I cheated myself out of being able to joyfully announce that I was going to, to be a mother. Instead, I had to guiltily admit it. The next morning, it was just the three of us around the breakfast table. I didn't know if Mom had told Dad until he stood up and walked around the table to stand beside me. And without saying a word, he put a prenatal vitamin in my mouth, and he said the five words that I will never forget. It's not about you anymore. The first time that I went to Lifeline Pregnancy Center, I was 10 weeks pregnant, scared and completely unprepared for my situation. But as I walked through their front door, I was joined by both of my parents. Little did I know at the time, but it was not my mom that had called Sharon Kelly to set the initial meeting, but it was my dad. He had also requested that the meeting be made after hours so it might be a little more intimate. The staff of Lifeline was really more like a house full of extended family members. They gladly met with me at night after I finished a day at work and were always warm and welcoming. Lifeline Pregnancy Center was such a blessing to me. I could go there and talk with a counselor any time I needed to, and that was always such an unbelievable comfort. Just knowing that they were there to love and support me and my unborn child was all that I needed. To know that I was not, in fact, the only one that was or had ever gone through an unplanned pregnancy was such a relief to me. I knew that I wasn't the only girl to go through this kind of humbling experience, but there in the middle of it, I sure got lonely. Whenever I felt like I had no one to talk to, I would turn to the volunteers at Lifeline. They were always there to listen to me and pray with me as I cried about my situation. God bless them in their endeavors. When I was seven months pregnant, my boyfriend came to see me at work one afternoon. 
He told me he was moving to find another job, one that would make him more able to support me and our baby. He ended up moving to Phoenix, Arizona the very next day. I called him three weeks later to check up on his progress at finding a job. It was then that he let me know that he had no intention of ever coming back to North Carolina. His words of comfort to me were, don't worry, you'll be a great mom. And that was our last conversation. The last two months of my pregnancy were the hardest. There are a lot of mistakes that people can make throughout their lives, sin sins that can be easily hidden or denied. The looks of awe from seeing my ever-growing belly quickly turned to looks of judgment as their eyes traveled from my belly to my bare ring finger. Being pregnant was an extremely humbling time for me, and it was then that I truly learned to lean on the Lord. As I pursued him and his will for both my life and the life of my unborn child, he filled the gaps of my heart. On May 18, 2005, my son Gabriel was born. I chose the name Gabriel because it means messenger of God. It's amazing to me that God always decides to use an unlikely source to send a powerful message straight to the heart of someone. To me, the unlikely source was my son, is my son. Every time I see his face, whether he is smiling or sleeping, I am humbled, and I know that God is so good. He gave me a beautiful son, and with my son came a brand new beginning for my life. After my son was born, I began to pray for the one man that God had prepared for me. I started to tell God all the qualities that I wanted in a husband and as a father figure for, God to look, for Gabe to look up to. I wanted him to be a good Christian man who loved God. I wanted him to come from a stable home. I wanted him to love kids, and I wanted him to be close to his own mom. I know that compared to all the traits that God can give someone, these seem trivial, but they were important to me. On June the 20th, 2008, I went on a blind date to meet a man that was born and raised here in Elkin, yet someone I had never before met. Turned out that Clint was a born-again Christian, raised in a Christian home, and unlike so many other families, his parents were still married. He had been divorced for two years, and since his wife had left him three years before, he had pray been praying for the woman that God had prepared for him. He loved kids as he had two small children that he was raising alone as a single dad. I felt like my checklist to God was being crossed off one item at a time, all except for one. Was he close to his mom? Turns out that Clint was close to his mom. They were next door neighbors. <laughs> I think God has a good sense of humor. Two months after our first date, Clint proposed and I accepted. On April 25, 2009, I walked down the aisle as a single girl on her father's arm and walked back down the aisle a married woman with her husband. Being a newlywed with three small children was something that I knew nothing about, but I soon came to love my new role and my new family. One month before our first anniversary, we expanded our family by a new member as I gave birth to our son, Eli. Now our family was complete. After Eli's birth, I began to battle depression. I soon became ta began taking antidepressants and seeing a therapist. As my depression deepened, our marriage began to suffer. I was in such a dark place that I was starting to consider ending our two-year marriage. I have learned during my life that if you earnestly pray to God to help you, to show you the way to save your marriage, he will. But when he does, it will be in God's way, in his time, and with his wisdom. In the summer of 2011, in the height of our marital turmoil, I decided to accompany my mom, two sisters, and my two small boys on a trip to Florida. We were going to visit with my grandma, who was battling cancer. I knew that I needed to go see her, but more than anything, I looked at the trip as an excuse to get away from my marriage. As days turned into weeks, the hospital halls were filled with silently breathed prayers for God's will, and the real importance of life made itself known to me. The last day of Grandma's life here on earth, my husband came to Florida to be with me, and through the grief and passing, the grief and sadness of her passing, our marriage began a new life. We realized the importance of forgiveness and loving each other. 
I miss grandma every day, but I truly believe that God used her illness and her passing as a way to save my marriage. God is always working, even when you don't realize that he is. He restores marriages and he gives new life to families that have experienced loss. Two days after Eli's second birthday, I discovered that our family was not in fact complete like we thought it was. <laughs> after four positive pregnancy tests, we told our families that we were going to be welcoming a new member. God knew what I didn't, that I needed a daughter. During my pregnancy, during a routine ultrasound, we learned that our daughter had a cyst in her brain and a short nasal bone. Both her short, soft markers were Down syndrome. I was told by my doctor that some decisions would need to be made. Ultimately, I made the decision to pray. Job 12.10 says, In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Our prayers may be awkward, our attempts may be feeble, but since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it, our prayers do make a difference. My prayer life began to grow right along with my daughter. I never prayed that she would be born without Down syndrome. I just prayed that his will be done. It is amazing the amount of peace that comes when you accept his will in your life. On a follow-up visit and another ultrasound, the technician was unable to find the cyst on her brain. As she explained that the cyst simply was not there, I breathed a prayer of thanks to God. On November the 2nd, 2012, Scarlett was born. After being checked out by the nurses, they told us that there was no evidence of Down syndrome and that she had passed her APGAR with a 10, the highest score a baby can get. Scarlett is now three years old and such a source of joy for our family. Gabe is now 10 years old and in the fifth grade. He is an avid reader and loves geology. He witnesses to his classmates and keeps his Bible in his desk along with his math book. On September the 2nd, 2014, Gabe was baptized, and as he walked down into the water, he turned towards the congregation and waved at us. <laughs> he is such a ray of sunshine in my life. When he was just seven years old, Gabe said to me, you know, Mama, God loves everybody in this world. But there are some people that don't like God. You know why? Because they don't know him. <laughs> that takes a lot of courage for someone to be so transparent with you. So I appreciate Katie and her testimony. And it just went beyond that initial birth of Gabe and how that God, um, you know, just had, has taught her many lessons. And thank the Lord that Gabe's life was spared. Um, and, and to know that he now is um, one of our brothers in the Lord. <laughs> and that's so, ex that's so ex exciting for me as a director as I've seen some of the, the women that have come through our, our center and have given birth and then later we keep up with them and find out that their children are accepting the Lord and that's just the most exciting thing. Uh, they're our little grandchildren, <laughs> we could say. <laughs> Uh, just as a um, closure, over the last 19 years, Lifeline began, we started seeing clients in 1997, and that's been um, almost 19 years ago. And God has just really worked in so many lives through those years. Last year, I was, uh, took an opportunity that we had presented to us to go to Washington, D.C. for the March for Life and participated in a uh, something prior to the March for Life, which was Babies Go to Congress. And um, we were able to take a client with us. It wasn't Katie, it was another lady and her son who was 14. And we were able to go into the, the House of Representatives in the, in the, in the Supreme, uh, State um, Senate, I mean, U.S. Senate. But anyway, we were able to go to those offices and say to our representatives, you know, this is what a pregnancy center is doing in, our, in North Carolina, in, your, in a community in North Carolina. And it was exciting to be able to take a 14-year-old boy 
who was dressed in a suit and tie who we saw come to life through Lifeline. His mother gave life to him because she came to Lifeline. Um, and God worked in her heart that way. And what God has in store for these, these children now that are growing up, Gabe is how old? He'll be 11. In he's May. 11, and he's got such a wonderful future ahead of him. Smart young man. But over the years of ni over those 19 years, I had to come up with a community impact report for this um, uh, meeting that we went to with our representatives up there in D.C. And I had to come up with a, some statistics of what we have done over the past 19 years, 18 at that time. We've seen over 500 babies born. How many are in this room today? Maybe 300 or less? So just think about 500 people that are here that may not would have been here, here if it hadn't been for a pregnancy center here in your community. And so many of them, uh, their parents have grown stronger in the Lord or have come to know the Lord and now they're raising those children in some homes that are their godly homes. Praise God. Not only do we, are we here to help these women to see life for their children, but we walk alongside of them afterwards. We, we will help them until their child turns two years old with all kinds of parenting um, lessons that they can take. It's called Earn While You Learn. And during that time that they're coming in and having classes with us, we grow close to these women. And, and sometimes the guys come along with them too. And um, so we're here to help them to, to, to see that they're better parents, to help them through that process and just walk beside them. And so just pray for us as we go through that. We don't want to just save the babies, but we want to be there for the moms and for the dads and for that home. We see such a need for there to be a, you know, a home for these children to be in with a mother and a father. And um, so saying that, we, are, we have something coming up on February 12th. I know it's short notice, but if any of you men feel like God leading you to maybe get more involved, we're hoping to start a ministry for men at the center. When they come in with these ladies, that we just don't leave them there and they're tagging along, but we have something there that can, a, man, a man can come in and actually work with those men and, um, and help them to strengthen their relationships and maybe point them to Jesus and see a change in their lives as well. So uh, just pray for us as we, as we do this. You can get more information about it. I have a flyer. I think I sent it to the church, but if you don't, if you don't have it, I'll, um, I'll leave that here. Uh, we just need to know, know by Friday if you'd be interested uh, in taking this one-day class. Uh, that's for men only. And um, that is something maybe you could get involved with. I'd love to give you some more statistics on Lifeline. You can find out about it. You can go to our website, uh, lifelinehelps.org, and, and get some information. You had a bulletin insert today for the sanctity of life, and on the back are some things, that, ways you can get involved in our phone number. Our contact information is on there. So if you have any questions that you would like to talk to us about or maybe you could get involved, um, just give us a call or email us and let us know. We'd be lo love to plug you in so that you can get some blessings out of this as well. <clears throat> um, so uh, as we think about closing up this service today, I just want to thank you as a church uh, for your, not just your financial support on a monthly basis, that is so important. I just want you to know that those steady, consistent gifts that come in are what gives us our financial stability, and we're dependent on your church and other churches, individuals. We have two fundraisers a year that help us with our finances. Um, that's what we really depend on uh, to make sure that we can see the Katie's mm -hmm. <laughs> in our community and, and those other women and that we can save those babies' lives and that we can point these people to Jesus. And like I said to begin with, uh, we're a Christian ministry. And as a Christian ministry, we are being faithful to present uh, the gospel, not just in word, but in deed. And we feel that we are an arm 
or a part of Pleasant Hill Baptist Church because it could be women that you may not be able to reach. They're coming to us and we may be able to reach them, but because of your support, your prayers, and maybe you're even coming alongside us in another way is what helps us to be able to do just that. So we just thank you so much uh, for all that you do for us. And don't just think about this one time a year as being sanctity of life, but remember, it's every day, every person. And we should just give God glory. That's what we want to do. All we do is for God's glory. It's not for my glory. It's not for Katie's glory. It's not for any of our glory, but only to him who deserves it. So we thank you very much. I don't know about you, but uh, I've been moved today. I've been blessed. I thank you, uh, Sharon and Katie, for coming, and especially you, Katie, for sharing uh, so much of your personal life with us today and being so transparent with us. Um, you know, I, w I couldn't help but think of what Paul said in the book of Romans, that all things work together for good for those that love the Lord, for those that are called according to his purpose. I hope that you will leave here today thinking about what you've heard. I hope you will leave here today knowing that there is a place where you as an individual can uh, get involved. As uh, Sharon has shared with us today, there, there will be opportunities for men and women to get involved firsthand in this particular ministry. Another thing that we can do is pray, and she's mentioned that as well. But we can also give. I know that we as a church, we support them financially. Uh, but I learned this recently, and Sharon didn't say anything about this, but I called her to be sure that it was true because I'd heard it in the last couple of weeks after I had scheduled her to come and to speak this morning. But uh, one of their major um, individuals that donate to the pregnancy center, uh, for whatever reasons, and that's between them and the Lord, uh, they lost that that donor and so uh, it's really been difficult for them financially this year and so I mentioned this Wednesday night I also sent out a phone tree this past week to let you know those of you who are members here let you know that we would be receiving an offering this morning for Lifeline Pregnancy Help Center and so I'm going to ask our ushers if th at this time if they would uh, to receive this offering and this offering is for Lifeline Pregnancy Center and I hope that uh, you will give as the Holy Spirit uh, leads you to give. And also, I want to mention something else. Um, Billy Twedell, who he and his family have been here in our church for quite some time, part of this fellowship and our brothers and sisters in the Lord, uh, Billy has come up with a bumper sticker. And, and you just have to know Billy. His, man, his heart is, this is where his heart is in doing things like this. But Billy has come up with a bumper sticker about abortion. And it says that abortion is dehumanizing. And if you would like one of these stickers, he has a whole box of them this morning. And uh, so you can just see, Billy, Billy, would you stand up and just sort of turn around and let everybody see who you are? And uh, so if you want one of these bumper stickers, see Billy today. And I'm going to get one to go on my vehicles or get a couple to go on my vehicles. And uh, so that's something else we can do. Just let people know where you stand um, and that you stand on the authority of God's word about this issue. I appreciate all of you being here today. Um, I know we haven't, um, I, I just want us to have an invitation as we always do on Sunday morning, Sunday night. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Gary to come and prepare for that. Uh, but if you're here today and, and uh, perhaps you're not a Christian and you've never been saved, but God has moved in your heart today and he's convicted you of your sin and righteousness and, and judgment to come as the Bible says in John 16. And perhaps he's drawing you, and, and God has spoken to you today through what you have heard. I just want to invite you to come and give your heart and life to Jesus. I'll be standing down here in just a moment to greet you and to help you any way that I can. You may be here today, and you may be a Christian. You know that you're saved and, and born again, and you know that when you die, you're going to heaven. But you may be struggling with something in your life. It may not even have to do with sanctity of Life Sunday, but I just want to encourage you to come. I, again, I will be here. We have others that will come and, and pray with you and pray for you. So I just want to invite you to stand, if you would please, very reverently and quietly. 
as uh, we have our invitation hymn this morning. And again, I'll be standing here to greet you and help you so you come as the Holy Spirit may lead you.